Chapter 7. The Oriental Fount The student of the changing conceptions of modern Western thought is keenly aware of the remarkable influence being exerted by the centuries-old philosophies and metaphysics of India and other countries of the Orient. This is all the more remarkable when it is remembered that until about 50 or 60 years ago, it was practically impossible to obtain an English translation of the leading Hindu philosophical works, and other countries were but little better off, as we may see when we consider that Schopenhauer, when he wished to study the Upanishads, was unable to find the principal books translated into English or German, and was compelled to gather up fragments translated in several languages, and then to have them retranslated into German. But the work of Max Muller and other Orientalists have now placed in our hands careful translations of the sacred books of the East, and the result is that the subtle essence of the Oriental thought has permeated every circle of philosophical, metaphysical, and religious thought the influence of the Theosophical Society has done much in the direction of familiarizing the Western world with certain of the Oriental ideas, and the world's fair parliament of religions did much to call the attention of the West to the buried riches of the Eastern thought. The student who begins the task of penetrating into the maze of Hindu thought is at once struck with the remarkable resemblance of the ideas enunciated thousands of years ago in India to the much later ideas of ancient Greece, and the two thousand years still later conception of modern Western thinkers. There is an unbroken thread of thought running through them all, upon which the various philosophical and metaphysical systems have been strung like beads. Edward Carpenter has well said, We seem to be arriving at a time when, with the decline or our knowledge of the globe, a great synthesis of all human thought on the ancient and ever-engrossing problem of creation is quite naturally and inevitably taking shape. The world-old wisdom of the Upanishads, with their profound and impregnable doctrine of the universal self, the teachings of Buddha or of Lao Tse, the poetic insight of Plato, the inspired sayings of Jeans and Fani, the speculations of Plotinus, or of the Gnostics, and the wonderful contributions of later European thought, from the 14th century mystics down through Spinoza, Berkeley, Kant, Hegel, Schopenhauer, Ferrier, and others. All these, combining with the immense mass of material, furnished by modern physical and biological science and psychology, are preparing a great birth, as it were. And out of this meeting of elements is already arising a dim outline of a philosophy which must surely dominate human thought for a long period. A new philosophy we can hardly expect or wish for, since indeed the same germinal thought of the Vedic authors come all the way down history, even to Schopenhauer and Whitman, inspiring philosophy after philosophy and religion after religion. Having its headwaters back in the early centuries of history, the Hindu philosophical thought has flowed down through the ages, irrigating and nourishing many fertile fields of philosophy, metaphysics, and religion. There is very little, if anything, in these fields of thought which may not be traced back to the Hindu influence. Max Muller and Paul Dusen have borne evidence that in the Vedas and the Upanishads may be found the seed thoughts for every philosophical conception that the Western mind has ever evolved. As an authority has said, Every possible form of human philosophical speculation, conception, or theory has been advanced by some Hindu philosopher during the centuries. It would seem that the Hindu philosophical mind has acted as the finest sieve, through which strained the volume of human philosophical thought, every idea of importance being gathered and applied, by someone, at some time, in India. Victor Cousins said, When we read the poetical and philosophical monuments of the Far East, Above all those of India, which are beginning to spread in Europe, we discover there many a truth, and truths eighty profound, and which make such a contrast with the meanness of the results at which European genius has sometimes stopped, that we are constrained to bend the knee before the philosophy of the East, and to see in this cradle of the human are the native land of the highest philosophy. India contains the whole history of philosophy in a nutshell. Sir Munnier Williams says, Indeed, if I may be allowed the anachronism, the Hindus were Spinozites more than 2,000 years before the existence of Spinoza, and Darwinians many centuries before Darwin, and evolutionists many centuries before the doctrine of evolution had been accepted by the scientists of our time, and before any word like evolution existed in any language of the world. Professor Hopkins says, Plato was full of Sankian thought, worked out by him, but taken from Pythagoras. Before the 6th century, 
BC, all the religio-philosophical ideas of Pythagoras were current in India. If there were but one or two of these oases, they might be set aside as accidental coincidences, but such coincidences are too numerous to be the result of chance. Davies says, Capilla's system is the first formulated system of philosophy of which the world has a record. It is the earliest attempt on record to give an answer, from reason alone, to the mysterious questions which arise in every thoughtful mind about the origin of the world, the nature and relations of man and his future destiny. The human intellect has gone over the same ground that it occupied more than 2,000 years ago. Hopkins says, both Thales and Parmenides were indeed anticipated by Hindu sages, and the Eleatic school seems but a reflection of the Upanishads. Schlegel says, even the loftiest philosophy of the Europeans, the idealism of reason as it is set forth by the Greek philosophers, appears in comparison with the abundant light and vigor of Oriental idealism like a feeble Promethean spark in the full flood of heavenly glory of the noonday sun, faltering and feeble and ever ready to be extinguished. The Orient, India in particular, is the home of the idealistic philosophy which is now exerting such an influence on Western thought. So closely identified with idealism is the highest Hindu philosophy that to the average person all Hindu philosophy is identified with idealism. But this is quite wrong. India, the home of idealism, and whose thought has carried that doctrine to its last refinement of tenuity, is also the home of every other form of philosophical thought which has ever been evolved from the mind of man. As far back as the time of Buddha, we find there had been in existence for many centuries various schools of philosophical thought far removed from idealism, many of which have been revamped or rediscovered by modern Western thinkers. We find some of the oldest Buddhistic writings vigorously combating these heterodox schools and pointing to their errors. The following quotation from Dr. J. E. Carpenter will surprise many readers. He says, the eagerness with which the speculations concerning the self were pursued may be inferred from the conspectus of sixty wrong views about it, according to the Buddha. On the other band, there were teachers daring enough to deny the first principles on which the Brahmanical were all based, viz. Karma. Such among the Budba's contemporaries were the agnostic, who repudiated all knowledge of the subject, the materialist Ajita of the hairy garment, who allowed no other life, rejected the claim to knowledge by higher insight and resolved man into the four elements, earth, water, fire, air, which dispersed at death. The indifferentist Purana Kasapa, who acknowledged no moral distinctions, and consequently no merit or reward, and the determinist Makali of the Kaupen, who indeed recognized the samsara, the chain of rebirth and phenomenal existence, but admitted no voluntary action, and hence no karma, the fruit of action, each individual only working out the law of its nature which it could not modify or control, the the cause of everything being found in destiny, impersonal necessity, or fate. In addition to the schools mentioned above, the Hindu school of materialism, the Charvakas, or Lokiyatikas, was founded about 3,000 years ago and has always had a following, although despised by the Orthodox Hindus. The Charvakas not only held to the material nature of the universe and all things contained therein, but also held that the individual perished at the death of the body, there being no such thing as a soul. They held to the ideal, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. They denounced the priests as impostors and all religions as fallacies designed to delude and rob the people, and reviled the Vedas, or sacred books as drivel and falsehood cleverly formulated to delude and control the people. These doctrines will have a familiar sound to the Western reader of today, and yet they were current in India from 500 to 1,000 years before the Christian era and have bad followers ever since. In philosophy and in religion, India has given birth to the highest possible and lowest possible conceptions. There have been no heights to which the Hindu mind has feared to climb and there have been no depths into which it has not descended. The most refined ideals and the most gross conceptions have been entertained by the Hindus. The mental and spiritual soil which has given nourishment to the noblest philosophical plants and trees, from which have come the fairest flowers and the richest fruits, has also given life to the most noxious weeds and the most poisonous varieties of mental and spiritual fungi. In the Garden of Oriental Thought, 
one searching for the rarest and most beautiful flowers and richest fruit will find it, but he must beware of the mental toadstools, spiritual deadly nightshade, and psychic loco weed which beset the paths. In Hindu thought the extremes meet. It is the land of the spiritual paradox. While it is true that the various orthodox Hindu schools of philosophical thought apparently differ materially from each other, it will be found that these differences are but upon points of interpretation and theories of the manner in which the one reality manifests as the many of the phenomenal world. In other words, the differences are regarding the how of the manifestation, rather than the fundamental principles themselves. Under the various schools of the Hindu thought will be found a common fundamental principle of the one life and one self of the universe. All true Hindu thought believes that the ultimate reality is one, and that the phenomenal universe is composed of manifold and varied manifestations, emanations, or reflections of that one. It is the same fundamental thought that caused the Grecian conception of the world spirit. Whether this one be called the Absolute, Brahman, Krishna, or simply that, by the various Hindu schools, it is always regarded as one. The Hindu philosophy is essentially monistic. It holds that all is one, and one is all, that the one is all that is, ever has been, ever will be, or ever can be. Beyond the one there is held to be but nothing, illusion, maya, mortal mind. It is more than monistic, it is ultramonistic. Swami Vivekananda, the apostle of the Vedana philosophy of India, who visited this country several years ago, attracting marked attention from many of the best minds of our land, brings out this fundamental idea of the Hindu philosophy in the following extracts from his lectures. He said, where law there any more misery for him who sees this oneness in the universe, this oneness of life, oneness of everything? This separation between man and man, man and woman, man and child, nation from nation, earth from moon, moon from sun, this separation between Adam and Adam is the cause really of all the misery, and the Vedanta says this separation does not exist, it is not real. It is merely apparent, on the surface. In the heart of things there is unity still. If yon go inside yon will, and that unity between man and man, women and children, races and races, high and low, rich and poor, the gods and me, all are one and animals, too, if you go deep enough, and be who bag attain to that has no more delusion. Where is there any more delusion for him? What can delude him? He knows the reality of everything, the secret of everything. Where is there any more misery for him? What does he desire? He has traced the reality of everything unto the Lord, that center, that unity of everything, and that is eternal bliss, eternal knowledge, eternal existence. Neither death nor disease nor sorrow nor discontent law there. In the center, the reality, there is no one to be mourned for, no one to be sorry for. Heba penetrated everything, the pure one, the formless, the bodiless, the stainless. He is the knower. He is the great poet, the self-existent he who is giving to everyone what he deserves. When man has seen himself as one with the infinite being of the universe, when all separateness has ceased, when all men, all women, all angels, all gods, all animals, all plants, the whole universe has peen melted into that oneness, then all fear disappears. Whom to fear? Can I hurt myself? Can I bill myself? Can I injure myself? Do you fear yourself? Then will all sorrow disappear. What can cause me sorrow? I am the one existence of the universe. Then all jealousies will disappear. Of whom to be jealous? Of myself? Then all bad feelings disappear. Against whom shall I have this bad feeling? Against myself? There is none in the universe but me. Kill out this differentiation. Kill out this superstition that there are many, he who, in this world of many, sees that one. He who, in this mass of insentience, sees that one sentient being. He who in this world of shadow catches that reality, unto him belongs eternal peace, unto none else, unto none else. We find in the above expression of Hindu monism the keynote that is predominant in the modern Western philosophical, metaphysical, and theological thought. All that modern Western monistic idealism is asserting so strongly has been asserted, centuries before, and even more strongly by the Hindu sages. Compare the above utterances of the world-old truths of the Vedanta, as voiced by Vivekananda, with the latter-day utterances.
In the Christian Science textbook, Science and Health, by Mary Baker G. Eddy, on the page preceding the table of contents, we find several quotations, one of which is as follows, I, 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 itself, I, the inside and outside, the what and the why, the when and the where, the low and the high, all E, 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 itself, E. In the same book, we find the following given as the scientific statement of being, there is no life, truth, intelligence, nor substance in matter. All is infinite mind and its infinite manifestation, for God is ail in all. Spirit is a mortal truth. Matter is mortal error. Spirit is the real and eternal. Matter is the unreal and temporal spirit is God, and man is his image and likeness hence man is spiritual and not material. Emerson says of the over-soul, truth, goodness, and beauty are but different faces of the same alt. God is, and all things are but shadows of him. The true doctrine of omnipresence is that God reappears with all his parts in ever, moss and cobweb. The value of the universal contrives to throw itself into every point. Do not these ideas breathe the very spirit of the inner Hindu thought? This idea of the immanent God, or the higher pantheism, is permeating the thought of today, as we have shown in our first paper of the series. In that paper, we quoted the following from the articles of Harold Balche in the Cosmopolitan magazine. Not only in religious rhetoric, but in reality, the schoolmen say, is man the avatar of God? They say that this is not an atheistic banishment of God and his holy angels, but is, on the contrary, the enthronement of a new Jehovah, a God that has become conscious and potent in the human mind. Among some of the New Thought cults we hear of teachers boldly asserting and teaching their pupils to assert that, I am God, there is none other than God, therefore as I am, I must be God, otherwise, I am not at all. One of the widely printed bits of advanced thought verse is the following, which brings out very plainly the essence of the higher pantheism in modern thought. Thon great, eternal infinite, the great unbounded whole. Thy body is the universe, thy spirit is the soul. If thou dost fill immensity, if thou art nil in all, if thou wert here before I was, I am not here at all. How could I live outside of thee? Dost thou ail earth and air? There surety is no place C.O.R. me, outside of everywhere. If thou art God, and thou dost fill immensity of space, then I am God. Think as you will, or else I have no place. And if I have no place at all, or if I am not here, banished I surely cannot be, for then I'd be somewhere. Then I must be a part of God, no matter if I'm small. And if I'm not a part of Him, there's no such God at all. Is not the spirit of the Hindu thought manifested throughout this Western expression Professor William James says? We may fairly suppose that the authority which absolute monism undoubtedly possesses, and probably always will possess over some persons, draws its strength far less from the intellectual than from mystical grounds. To interpret absolute monism worthily, be a mystic. Observe how radical the theory of the monism here is. Separation is not simply overcome by the one. It is denied to exist. There is no many. We are not parts of the one. It has no parts, and since in a sense we undeniably are, it must be that each of us is the one, indivisibly and totally. An absolute one, and I that one. Surely we have here a religion which, emotionally considered, has a high pragmatic value. It imparts a perfect sumptuosity of security.